Every year, over £40 billion is stolen from the UK's public purse. But up and down Britain, an army of fraud fighters is battling to win it back. And every pound lost to the public purse via fraud is a pound lost to our public services. That money is for people that need it. You just can't go about stealing money and hope to get away with it. People that defraud the public purse are despicable. From paying for the police and our health service, filling in potholes and emptying our dustbins, to making sure everyone has a roof over their head. The team had to follow the money trail. I'm just going to investigate the incident. Gross. I suspect that's not your badge. I'm definitely sure that there's a fraud. The investigator's mission has never been more vital. We managed to recover over £108,000. This prosecution was really important. Can't the claimant being able to get his way out of this one? No one is beyond our reach. If you get a knock on the door from us, you might be in trouble. The fraud squad are on the case. Today, HMRC launched the biggest tax fraud investigation ever undertaken. The weekend prior to the ruling coming out from the Court of Appeal judges was one of the worst weekends of my life. An NHS insider steals public money, potentially putting lives at risk. Stanard had actually invoiced the trust for £806,229.80. And a fraudster claims she's been jilted by her husband to bag thousands of pounds in benefits. If somebody is defrauding the system, they're actually taking the money out of everybody else's pockets from all the taxpayers. Why it can't be tolerated. All of our public services, from education to health to housing, are funded by taxes, and everyone needs to pay their fair share. But unfortunately, some people think the rules simply don't apply to them. This is the story of the biggest tax fraud in UK history. The amount of tax at stake with this was £107.9 million. Pounds. That was cash that was actually coming out of the public exchequer, out of mine in your pockets. Over 700 people are suddenly claiming millions of pounds in tax refunds, all from their investments into one company, Carbon Capital. At HMRC, alarm bells are ringing. The basic starting point for any HMRC investigation is a tax return. Paul Mayberry runs a specialist team of investigators based in Manchester. He doesn't know it yet, but the case is going to dominate his life for 10 years. The important thing to say at this point is that if this was true, it was all legal, it was all legitimate. None of the people, the investors, thought they were doing anything wrong. But the people taking their money definitely were doing something wrong. £108 million pounds worth of wrong. And those people ran Carbon Capital. They'd set up a scheme that claimed to allow investors to lower their tax bills by funding the replanting of thousands of acres of rainforest. The tax relief was very complicated, but in essence, each investor or investor group signed a contract to conduct research and development for £7.1 million. Pounds. Because it was non-refundable, it meant that the investors could claim a loss and offset that loss against their other income, therefore reclaiming any tax they'd paid in that year. It's a relief for research and development, which, understandably, uh, the government wants to promote. Paying less tax and saving the planet, is it as good as it sounds? HMRC decide to talk to the company directors. Michael Richards was the architect of this scheme. He was the front man. He, along with his colleague Robert Gold, were the main two people who drove this for a number of years. Richards meets with HMRC and shows a very impressive business model, which makes bold and exciting claims. They were going to replant an area the size of Greater London in Brazil to replant the Brazilian rainforest, which is a mind-boggling amount. 
Richards provides glossy brochures which they're using to attract investors. This was the main document that drove everything, and it's a very impressive, comprehensive, professionally put together document. The promise of an ethical green investment, along with massive tax savings, attracts over 700 wealthy investors. Celebrities, rock stars, and former England football players and managers all sign up. And from this day, defrauded about 20 million pounds from the investors just from this, this one document. But how did they do it? Through a web of companies all purporting to carry out a different part of the scheme, Carbon Capital attracts the investors. A second company called Environmental Guarantee Corporation holds the finances for the scheme. And a third company, Carbon Positive Trading, based in the Netherlands, is supposed to do research and development and, crucially, the actual tree planting. During that initial phase, Mike Richards met with HMRC. He explained how Carbon Capital Limited, Carbon Positive Trading Limited, and Environmental Guarantee Corporation Limited were totally independent companies. He was the carbon capital end of it, him and another, a number of other directors, but he knew nothing of the others. For the scheme to be legal, the three companies need to be completely independent of each other. My colleagues were never convinced that the three main companies were independent and they were acting independently. We needed to get to the bottom of that and to test what HMRC was being told. There was a lot of money going around here that the Exchequer is losing. And so we had to make sure that it was losing that legitimately. So far, HMRC have paid out tax refunds worth £2 million. But if the scheme proves to be legitimate, millions more will be owed to its investors and every penny will come from the public purse. Paul's investigator's instinct tells him something just doesn't add up. He orders a series of simultaneous raids on carbon capital. We thought there was enough suspicion there to go in front of a judge to authorise search warrants. This was a massive operation for HMRC. We uh, planned to arrest 15 individuals and also search 22 premises on one day and at the same time. This involved over 200 HMRC officers with liaison from the police as well. The coordination of that to ensure that everybody's doing exactly what they should be at 7 o'clock on any particular morning, this was a massive operation. Thankfully, the coordinated raids go off like clockwork. 15 individuals were arrested on the day. They were all interviewed. Each person is informed that they're a suspect in this case, but not a single one admits any wrongdoing. Are they all complicit? Are some of them being conned? Or has Paul got it wrong and the scheme is totally legit after all? 70 computers were seized on that day, all of which had to be reviewed. Reviewing the witness statements and trawling through the evidence is a massive task. This is not just one day and it's over. This is one day, then a lot of work. We have a pile of information that's new. We are going to banks and financial institutions and obtaining hundreds of bank statements to show monetary transactions and to trace those monies from where they should be and where they're going to. Paul also takes a closer look at the Dutch company that's supposedly planting the trees, Carbon Positive Trading. HMRC worked closely with the Dutch authorities. We searched premises in Holland uh, and seized material from them. We also went to banks uh, to obtain some of the financial records that we needed to uh, conduct the trial. It was an exhaustive search, but they found not a shred of evidence that had anything to do with trees. Forget a rainforest, not a single tree had been planted by the Dutch company. What it really was, was a piggy bank for Mike Richards and Robert Gold and the other co-conspirators. They used the company to fund trusts, bank accounts and other structures in Switzerland and siphon money off for their own benefit. Over £22 million has been transferred out of the UK, onto the Netherlands and then into secretive Swiss accounts. The money from British investors meant to replant a rainforest is instead simply funding the pair's own lavish lifestyles. 
They've bought luxury properties in London, Australia and Dubai and splashed the illicit cash on expensive watches and jewellery. Paul is more determined than ever to prove this fraud and bring Richards and Gold to justice. He approaches some of the world's most famously secret banks to ask for information. We went to the Swiss government and said, we need to look at this bank account. Despite the help of the Swiss government, the Swiss banks are slow to respond. And the reason soon becomes frustratingly clear. There were Swiss court proceedings where the defendants had challenged the Swiss government and were trying to stop them from providing that information to us. It took approximately two years for Switzerland to come back to us with the information we hoped to get. It's an uphill struggle, tougher than any investigation Paul's ever worked on. But finally, they receive a box of the vital paperwork from Switzerland. It was a eureka moment. Opening the box, sat in an office in Manchester, was one of the moments that I will always remember. Paul's patience and perseverance has paid off. This was the key to the entire investigation. In Switzerland, we obtained material that showed that Mike Richards and Robert Gold were running the entire show. Everything they'd told us to this point had been a lie. Everything they'd told a lot of their colleagues to this point had been a lie. Everything they'd told to the investors had been a lie. They were taking the money. Paul has all the information he needs. He recalls for interview all 15 of the people he'd interviewed after the dawn raids. One by one, he puts his evidence to them. And one by one, they're genuinely shocked. They believed in Richards and Gold and others that they'd been told the truth and that this was legitimate and that HMRC was barking up the wrong tree, frankly. And the Swiss material was the key to that because what it did was split open that group. The penny dropped for a lot of people. And at that point, a lot of the 15 became witnesses for the prosecution because they could show to us, my God, I didn't know any of this. If I'd have known this, I would have never done it. Now with the evidence he needs and witnesses in place, Paul can go to court. We were able to ask the CPS to charge Richards, Gold and others with conspiracy to cheat the public revenue. But this is far from the end of the story because this multi-million pound scheme has made Richards and Gold wealthy men, happy to pay for lawyers with plenty of perfectly legal tricks up their sleeve. The defence was that they did not control the research and development company. They did not control the Isle of Man company. So their defence was, we don't know what's going on in these companies. You, HMRC, have to help us here. The suspects slow down proceedings by asking HMRC to provide more and more information. Richards and Gold were saying that we've planted millions of trees and we don't know what happened in carbon positive trading. So we need you to find all of that material. And they find ways to undermine the investigation at every turn. They then started casting aspersions on the quality of the investigators, the quality of the computer material, and the length of time that was elapsing between that. First, the suspect's defense causes the delays. Then they exploit the delays to their advantage. There were lots and lots of court hearings. The amount of material was seven terabytes. Doesn't mean a lot, but we were told that if you printed that out, it would reach to the moon. The pair's lawyers say the case is now so complex that it would bamboozle a jury. They say there's no way their clients can get a fair hearing. Richards and Gold's lawyers attempt to exploit the complexity of the money trail that their own clients had created. So much so that uh, after five years' work, the judge basically stayed the proceedings. He said he didn't believe that HMRC could give these people a fair trial. And therefore, he was stopping the proceedings at that point, which, in essence, meant that Richards and Gold had got away with it.
the judge's ruling is disastrous for Paul's case. Two years' work to get the evidence to go to court. Five years of lawyers arguing over technicalities. All the public money spent trying to save the taxpayers' millions. Over a hundred million pounds will be paid out from the public purse if HMRC lose the case. This is incredibly disappointing, obviously. Later, how can Paul and the team get back from this? Our next case involves a massive fraud against the NHS by one of its own staff. A senior manager is callously abusing his position, stealing NHS cash to line his own pockets. This is the shocking story of an outrageous fraud that saw nearly a million pounds siphoned from the public purse. He's invoicing from a fictitious company for fictitious goods or services that weren't provided to the trust. A fraud that took money from patients who desperately needed it. Ben Rowe is a senior investigator with the NHS Counter Fraud Authority. My job involves the investigation of fraud against the NHS. It's like a puzzle, really. You, you get different pieces coming in and, and, and you put it all together to sort of work out the, the entire fraud. And Ben's next puzzle has just landed on his desk. He's been passed a case involving a trusted NHS manager. The investigation started during a national fraud initiative exercise that data matches public and private data. A counter fraud exercise has thrown up a hit. An NHS employee is also registered as a private company director. It's not illegal, but does warrant investigation. The employee is a senior manager with authority to spend thousands in NHS funds. Investigators fear there could be a conflict of interest. Barry Stannard was an IT manager, head of Unified Communications here at Broomfield Hospital, Essex, and he was in charge of all the telephony and computer equipment in that department. That include the purchasing and procurement of goods and services. Ben needs to establish what exactly Stannard's private company does. The data match identified that Stannard was a director of a company called BNC Communications, supplying Broomfield Hospital with telephony equipment. Stannard's company is supplying the NHS Trust with the goods and services that Stannard is also responsible for procuring. This case is out of the ordinary because Stannard is a senior manager, highly paid, and should be looking after the interests of the NHS. Ben smells a rat. You can have a stake in another company, you just have to fill out what's called a declaration of interest, which declares your interest in outside companies. But Stannard hasn't done that. In fact, he's done just the opposite. Stannard had provided two nil returns uh, to say he had no conflict of interest in any company outside of the NHS. He's made written declarations denying any conflicts. This is a red flag. It may be that Stannard's failed to declare his interest, but it may be that there's fraudulent activity taking place. Stannard's held both positions for years, and nobody knew about it. Until now. The conflict is clear, and Ben suspects there may be substantial fraud too, but he needs proof. First step is to identify whether any goods or services have been received, what was said to be arriving, telephones, data cards, things like that, to the department which Barry Stannard managed. Stannard is authorised to make individual purchases up to £7,500. Witness statements were taken from senior managers in the finance department. This gave us the information required to conduct an investigation. Ben discovers Stannard's placed regular orders with his own firm. But none of the items he's bought for the trust have arrived. Stannard was invoicing for things like telephone handsets, data cards and services such as the upkeep of telephones to Mid-Essex Hospital Trust the department for which he was the manager. What we're looking at at the moment is where someone has set up their own company to effectively use it as a vessel to launder money through. 
He's invoicing from a company for fictitious goods or services that didn't exist and weren't provided to the trust. Although he's only authorised for purchases up to £7,500, Stannard has been running his scam for years. Hundreds of fake invoices have crossed his desk, and the total amount he's embezzled is staggering. Further investigation identified a fraud of over £486,000. That's nearly half a million pounds that could have been spent on doctors, nurses and hospital beds. Money that could have reduced waiting times, improved patient care and potentially saved lives. But Stannard isn't finished yet. As Ben digs deeper, he discovers a second company also run by Stannard, and also supposedly supplying IT services to the hospital. This is an example of an invoice sent from Barry Stannard at Data Centre Power Services Limited. And this is for replacement batteries for phones and installation and fitting. The total cost there is £3,938.40, which is below his threshold of £7,500 for authorisation. What we're looking at here is an email sent to Barry Stannard from Data Centre Power Services Limited with a completely fictitious made-up name. This was Stannard's MO, basically. He sent an email to himself uh, to say that the goods or services were available, and Stannard would then reply to himself, stating that he wanted these goods or services to be delivered at the agreed price. Looking at invoices for fictitious goods or services that hadn't been received by Mid-Essex Hospital Trust for approximately £320,000. Stannard has abused his position and masterminded a scam to deal the hospital finances a devastating blow. Over a seven-year period, Stannard had actually invoiced the trust for £806,229.80. It's time to pull the plug on Stannard's IT scam and bring him in for questioning. Later, Stannard's lavish spending sprees are laid bare. Payments for luxury cars, uh, payments for top-of-the-range kitchens, family holidays, that sort of thing, was all paid for by the NHS. We all pay into the benefit system, knowing it'll support us if times get tough. Sadly, there are chances out there that will do anything to con the system, including our next scammer, a newlywed who said, I do, to fraud. The system is there to help people who need help. Genuine people who, from no fault of their own, can't work for whatever reason and have no income other than welfare benefits. If somebody is defrauding the system, they're actually taking the money out of everybody else's pockets, from all the taxpayers. They can't be tolerated. Karen Evans is a fraud investigator at the Department for Work and Pensions. This case is about a lady who claimed employment and support allowance stating that she had got married in June and that her husband had left her in July and she was now a single parent. She was claiming based on her living in social housing and living alone with her children. If the story of being a single parent is true, then the woman is entitled to the benefits she's receiving. And there's plenty of them. She received just under £10,000. Job seekers allowance of £1,100. Council tax benefit of £457. And housing benefit of just under £15,000. In four years, she's claimed a total of £29,569.17. 
but the Newport Benefits Office receives an anonymous phone call stating that although the woman is claiming benefits as a single mother, she is in fact still married and still living happily with her husband. We do have um, a benefit fraud hotline where you can phone up and report somebody who you consider might be committing benefit fraud and remain anonymous. We do rely on a lot of information like that to come to our attention. Acting on this anonymous tip-off, the local benefits office calls the woman in for an interview. She was interviewed by the compliance officer and he was concerned that she wasn't being truthful and that it needed further investigation. So it was passed for criminal investigation for further evidence to be obtained. The case lands on Karen's desk. She needs to work out if the woman is indeed living with her husband. Living together is a very common fraud. It's something that we do have to investigate a lot. It's very difficult to prove. We have to spend a lot of resources and a lot of time because we have to be able to link evidence to them as a couple, shared household expenses, uh, shared income and finances, childcare. All those things are taken into consideration. Karen starts by working out who the woman's husband is so she can investigate further. We obtained the marriage certificate to confirm who it was that she had married and the date of the marriage. We were then able to check to see if there was any other evidence linking him to the address. Now they know who he is, they need to find out where he lives. We can do a search on social media through our operational intelligence unit and they're able to look at social media accounts and see if there's anything there that's only in the public domain that links customers to possible undeclared partners. And the man's Facebook page does just that. He had clearly exclaimed his love for his wife over a long period of time when they had a baby together, his profound love for her and her baby, and the fact that they were a happy family. And it was all very clear, according to social media, that they were living as a family. The steer from social media is helpful and backs up the anonymous witness. But Karen now needs to go to more reliable sources. If we've got a suspicion that information is being withheld from us, that we may be able to locate through bank accounts. We are able to get bank accounts through the Social Security Fraud Act. We suspect that they are living as a couple, so we then have a valid reason to ask for that information. When she gets the information on the woman's bank account, Karen can clearly see that she's living a double life. She has two different bank accounts that tell two different stories. One that was for her benefits, which she only declared to us. She didn't declare any other account to us. So that account just showed her benefits being paid in and a basic lifestyle. But she has another bank account she has not declared. The second account showed her husband's wages being paid in, which at times were quite substantial and a totally different lifestyle. Karen now has the evidence she needs to take the woman to court. This is Haverford West Magistrates Court behind me. Um, the lady actually attended here and pleaded not guilty to making false representations. The not guilty plea means the case will be tried before a jury, taking up valuable court time and costing the public purse even more. The case was then referred on to Swansea Crown Court and at the pre-trial, she still pleaded not guilty. But faced with Karen's evidence, she changes her tune. She changed her plea to guilty and she was sentenced then. She received 12 month prison term, suspended for 18 months with a 20 day rehabilitation order. 
and Karen has put an end to another fraud against the public purse. There is no doubt in my mind that she would have continued to claim benefits falsely and continue to make false declarations had an investigation not continued. Plus, the offender will have to pay back the £29,500 she defrauded in full. People who need the welfare benefit system are the people who should be receiving it. So money that's been overpaid is money that's been taken from the taxpayer's purse and that should actually be going to the people who genuinely need it. In Manchester, HMRC are battling the biggest case of tax fraud in UK history. After two years of untangling a web of shady money transfers and shell companies, and five years arguing technicalities with lawyers, the case is hanging by a thread. We had to decide what to do. So the investigation team as a whole decided that we must appeal this decision. And to do that, we had to put together a case to show that the judge had been mistaken in his ruling, and it was the case that we could do this. They're determined that the scheme's architects, Michael Richards and Robert Gold, will face justice. Fortunately, Paul and his team are not alone in wanting to appeal. We got support from lots of other prosecutions agencies, the police, the National Crime Agency, the Serious Fraud Office, who were all watching this case with interest because it was a, a, one of the biggest fraud cases that have been prosecuted in the UK. If this ruling stood, then serious fraud investigations in the UK would come to a standstill because the prosecution was being set an impossible task. Paul and his team are not just fighting for this case of huge fraud against the public purse. They're fighting for the future of all cases. What we went on to show was that the computer systems we had put in place were groundbreaking for investigations of this type. The case goes to the Court of Appeal and is heard by three of the highest judges in the land. I'll be absolutely honest and say that the weekend prior to the ruling coming out from the Court of Appeal judges was one of the worst weekends of my life. I knew this judgment was coming, but I couldn't sleep. Finally, the appeal court agrees that the trial must go ahead. They overturned the original stay to the prosecution, appointed a new trial judge and ruled that the disclosure of the computer systems, the information that we provided to the defence and the systems we put in place to allow them to explore that were perfectly acceptable from a fairness perspective and the individuals could get a fair trial as we always thought they could. After five long years battling Richards, Gold and their lawyers through the UK courts, Paul can take them to trial. We all knew this was going to be a long trial and the judge set aside a time of nine months for the trial period. This will be a long and complicated case. The trial was held in Southwark Crown Court uh, in London, central London. Uh, the case team, myself and my, the case team are based in Manchester. Uh, we had to decamp to London for nine months, putting our lives on hold as well. The trial is relentless and all-consuming, and the cost to the public purse is spiralling. During the trial, uh, the prosecution uh, brought witnesses from all over the UK, but we also brought people from America, from the Isle of Man, from South Africa. Uh, the logistics of it were mind-blowing. And Richards and Gold continue to lie. Throughout the trial, Richards, Gold and others maintained that they were innocent they didn't plead guilty. They were on the stand for weeks on end. They perpetuated the lie. They came up with new stories, frankly. It was up to the jury over that nine-month period to decide who was telling the truth, 
did HMRC have the evidence to prove that these guys had conspired to defraud the public revenue? When the trial ends, Paul waits a nerve-wracking three weeks for the jury to reach their verdict. They managed, incredibly, to summarise that nine months of th things that they'd heard into a three-week period and come to their conclusions. And they found that Mike Richards and Robert Gold were guilty. For Paul and his team, the last 10 years they've dedicated to this case has all paid off. The initial investigation, two years fighting the banks for the information, five years fighting the lawyers to get to court, and nine months at trial. I admit I had a little moment. Uh, I had to have a sit down and I, I shed a tear. I honestly did. Just the basic relief just came out of me that the 10 years of hard work for myself, the team, and hundreds of other people had actually paid off and the jury had seen through their lies. That was a massive relief to everybody. This was the biggest tax fraud at that point, may still be, that we'd ever investigated. And as a result, the sentences are strict. The judge handed down sentences of 11 years uh, custodial to both Richards and Gold, and a total of 45 years custodial sentences to all of the core conspiracies. And the judge orders Richards to repay HMRC nearly £10 million, and Gold to repay over £2.8 million, or their sentences will each be extended by 10 years. Richards didn't repay his, so his sentence was extended to 21 years and he's still liable for that money. The wealthy investors who mistakenly backed this fraudulent tax avoidance scheme will not get their money back from HMRC. But Paul and his team have saved the country over 100 million pounds. This is what HMRC does. This is what the teams, the criminal teams, the civil teams, this is what we do. There are countless of us throughout the country doing work such as this, and we will continue to make sure that no one is beyond our reach, that everyone pays into the public purse at the right time. In Essex, NHS fraud investigator Ben Rowe is on the case of an IT manager who's been defrauding the hospital trust where he works for years. He's been rumbled signing off fake invoices to the tune of £800,000. But time's up for this high-tech hustler. Over a seven-year period, Stanard had actually invoiced the trust for £806,229.80. He's been using NHS funds to pay for luxury cars, holidays and home improvements. But after seven years cashing in on public money, it's time for the suspect to face the music. Stannard is interviewed under caution. In his first interview, Stannard gave no comment and supplied a prepared statement, admitting his guilt to the allegations put to him. A full confession is a great result for Ben, but he still needs to try to find the stolen money. Stannard is released under investigation and suspended from the NHS on full pay. Yet another cost to the public purse. The first stage of my investigation is to identify any accounts or assets held by Stannard and list them out for further financial inquiries to be made. There are a lot of accounts to look through, credit cards, various bank accounts, loans, HP agreements, things like that. We're looking for particular patterns of spending or areas of heavy spend and Ben makes a startling discovery. It was identified that the VAT number used by Stannard's company was incorrect. One VAT number was not registered and another was registered to a legitimate company that was not Stannard's. This allowed Stannard to charge an additional 20% to the Mid-Essex Hospital Trust on his invoices without paying anything back to the revenue services. And this seemingly small VAT trick has brought in the big bucks for Stannard. 
another £130,000, this time from the taxman. The grand total of Stannard's thefts now stands at £806,000. Ben takes immediate action. So I contact HMRC to talk about a joint investigation to bring charges of cheating the public revenue against Stannard, as well as fraud against the NHS. A lavish spending spree is uncovered. Payments for luxury cars, for example, a Jaguar, uh, payments for top-of-the-range kitchens and improvements to Stannard's property, as well as family holidays. And he also spent quite a lot of money on the upkeep of his koi carp collection in a pond in his back garden. There were transactions to a pet shop that were in the region of hundreds of pounds each month. And while Stannard's pets were kept in the lap of luxury, the sick and needy were starved of NHS funds. And keeping koi carp wasn't Stannard's only fishy indulgence. He had a bit of a passion for musical instruments and actually bought an organ in the region of £30,000 for himself. Hardly the organ transplant the money was meant for. At this point, we need to invite Stannard in for a second interview to explain these payments. Stannard again provides me with a prepared statement stating that he, as an individual, was the only person involved in this fraud. No other person had knowingly received money from him, knowing that these were the proceeds of crime. It's been a complex 18-month multi-agency investigation. Ben has worked closely with colleagues from the Trust's own fraud investigation provider, RSM, and fraud investigators from HMRC. The case is now ready to go to court. So the charges against Stannard were two of fraud by failure to disclose on behalf of the NHS CFA and two for cheating the public revenue in terms of HMRC. Stannard entered a guilty plea on all four charges, was sentenced to eight years, but due to an early admission, the court granted him a third of his sentence, so he was only therefore charged for five years and four months. Although most of Stannard's ill-gotten gains have been frittered away, investigators are able to recover £200,000 and put that money back into the NHS. The team's efforts have paid off, and Ben can take comfort in knowing the disgraceful fraud is finally over. Stannard had committed this fraud over a time period of seven years, and there was nothing that I could see uh, that would say that he was going to stop defrauding the NHS and the taxpayer. Join us again when the Fraud Squad continue their fight. It's theft. It's stealing from you and I, the taxpayer. Bringing wrongdoers to justice and defending the public purse. When you see some of the extent of frauds, yes, it can make you angry. Mm -hmm.